after 13 years of living as a man, I have decided to take steps to detransition and resume my gender, identifying with my sex as female. Mm-hmm. All right, guys. So this one is going to be a lot to follow. But the transgender husband of whistleblower Jamie Reed. My name is Tiger Reed. I'm 44 years old. Now I'm a librarian and live in St. Louis. Which if you're not familiar with Jamie Reed. My name is Jamie Reed. I am the whistleblower from a pediatric transgender center here in St. Louis, Missouri. Jamie Reed was a former case manager at the Washington University Transgender Center in St. Louis, Missouri. And she ended up calling out the fact that basically they were not taking proper protocols in order to start transition on minors. So her husband, husband, and I'm not being disrespectful right now. This person is on their way to detransitioning. His name is Tiger Reed. He's been living as a man for the last 13 years, and he is now deciding to detransition. The reason I wanted to talk about this story so much is because a lot of people don't get it with me. I do understand 100% that gender dysphoria is a thing. Gender dysphoria disorder is pretty much what it sounds like. You're dysphoric, you're sad or upset about your gender. I am not at all trying to downplay that. I know some of you that may be watching may feel differently and I wouldn't tell you what to think. But what I would say is in my experience and what I've seen because I've had countless trans friends throughout my life, gender dysphoria is an actual thing. But for a much smaller part of the population than we're actually being told right now. And while I would never tell another adult what they can and can't do with their bodies, I think that is 100% up to us as adults as long as we're not hurting anybody else. I definitely do think that even adults need to think about what they're doing with some of what's called gender affirming care. There have been conversations around the health impacts of the testosterone for years. Because in some cases, even as an adult, when they've told you what it is these things are going to do to you. When I spoke to my doctors, I would be like, what is the long term effects of this? Like, what's going to happen to me? Am I going to die soon? I had one doctor tell me, well, men die younger anyway. That was his answer to me. I've had other endocrinologists tell me there are no studies we don't know. Side effects were presented to me, but everybody always thinks it's going to happen to somebody else. You don't actually realize what it's going to play out like in your actual life and when you're living it. So I have sleep apnea now. So I have to use a CPAP machine for probably the rest of my life. Kidney issues now, potential kidney disease, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, high triglycerides, depression and anxiety. That's directly correlating with taking testosterone. I have type 2 diabetes. I take those and I have to take that for early. I'm taking four pills at night and two in the daytime, not to mention the open cow bow game and the Ohio chain, rosemary oil so that my hair stops falling out. So I wanted to read this story in this person's own words. I'm sure I'll interject and then I'm sure I'll have an opinion at the end. But in my opinion, people like Tiger Reed and Jamie Reed are the real heroes in the LGBTQ and more specifically trans community right now. Because when people are brave enough to speak out, even though they know they're going to face public ire from both sides of the aisle, to me, that is heroic. To be able to say, I'm going to stand up and tell my story because I think this may help other people. Or I'm going to stand up and let people know about the way that a situation is being mishandled. A number of the conditions are being seen in many women who are utilizing testosterone. All of Tiger's medical care to do this to his body was covered by health insurance. And all of the steps to reverse this will not be. When they could just bow out and quietly move away from these situations, to me, that is true bravery because these people are actually choosing to put themselves right in the fire. And when it comes to people like this, there is a tendency for people that are detractors or even people that are sometimes from the community but don't agree with gender affirming care to be like, I told you so. And I think that people need to really fight that urge and instead see how these people and their stories can possibly help us as a society and if you're thinking about it from the LGBTQ perspective as a community to help people from making these same mistakes and maybe getting a little more counseling instead of just thinking that it's going to be a surgery or a pill or an injection that's going to fix everything. You can be a successful person in life and you don't have to be on hormones. You don't have to medically transition. You can be gender non-conforming and still be successful in your life. Taking the extra time to figure that out and really think about what you're doing is you have nothing to lose in that process. Trust yourself 
and slow down. You see it happening right now in mainstream society with Ozempic. There are a lot of people that don't necessarily need Ozempic and could probably do what they're trying to do just through diet and exercise. But instead, they're told, let's just get you on Ozempic. And now they're dealing with all sorts of health complications that are coming from that if you guys aren't paying attention to what's going on there. <laughs> What's up, everybody? Ty Rivera here, the absolute best LGBTQ comedian in the world. Before we get started, I'm just going to ask, as always, that you like, comment, and subscribe. If you want to leave a comment just to help me on the algorithm, but you don't know what to comment, just leave a knife. Because once again, the trans activists are going to come for my neck. So, like I said, I want to read this person's story in their own words. The headline of the article is, I spent 13 years living as a man, but after my spouse's expose, I'm detransitioning. By Tiger Reed. My name is Tiger Reed. I am a 44-year-old librarian in St. Louis, Missouri. Since 2016, I have been married to Jamie Reed. She is the whistleblower who exposed the alarming effects of gender-affirming medical care given to minors at the Washington University Transgender Center at St. Louis Children's Hospital in a 2023 article for the Free Press. Her story shocked the nation. I am also dad to five children we are raising together, two from Jamie's previous marriage and three we have adopted. And now, after 13 years of living as a man, I am now in the process of tapering down my weekly testosterone injections to begin the process of becoming a woman again. Jamie is the bravest person I know. I am not as brave. Though I didn't try to stop Jamie, I had grave doubts about her blowing the whistle. I wondered why she couldn't just quietly quit her job and protest and move on. I was scared for my safety, Jamie's, and our children's. I still am. All this created a huge rift in our marriage that we are still working to heal. When Jamie expose the harm gender affirming care does to vulnerable children and teens, many with a history of trauma and various mental health diagnoses. She was widely attacked by activists. That Jamie was married to me, a trans man, was powerful evidence she was no transphobe. But looking back, I realized the thing that threatened me the most about Jamie going public was something I didn't want to face. This was the knowledge that my spouse and a growing chorus of knowledgeable critics were right. They were right that there was something fundamentally amiss with the message, especially to young people that a swift gender transition was a safe, all-purpose solution to profound problems. This realization meant I had to address my own doubts about my own transition. I am now ready to publicly support Jamie. Not only that, I want to speak out about adult gender medicine and how people have been misled, sometimes unintentionally, by gender clinicians about its safety and effectiveness. I know there isn't a lot of sympathy for those of us who transition as adults. People assume you made your choice and you knew what you were signing up for. But in recent years, we have been finding out that reliable research for transition, especially concerning as long-term effects, is virtually non-existent. The comprehensive CAS review showed the lack of scientific underpinning for the commonly accepted medical treatments for gender dysphoria, hormones and surgery, especially for kids. And gender-affirming care fails to explore the often complex personal and psychological histories that lead people to believe transition is what they need. I knew that going on testosterone at age 30 31 and five years later having my breasts removed would bring profound physical changes. But no one I consulted prepared me for the emotional consequences of transition, for how the hormones would change not only my appearance, but how I felt about myself and the world. To understand how I decided to transition requires going back to my childhood. I was born in Miami in 1980 and named Roxanne. I never met my father. He died from a heroin overdose when I was young. My mother was addicted to drugs too, and the last time I saw her, I was in my early 20s. She passed away in 2023. When I was two years old, I was essayed by a stranger, which resulted in my being put in foster care. I moved in and out of foster care throughout my childhood, in between stints of living with my maternal grandparents who were divorced. My grandmother was extremely poor and troubled, and ultimately had a mental breakdown, which led me back to foster care. My grandfather, a severe alcoholic, was both verbally and physically abused. I knew from an early age that I was a lesbian, and I remember around the age of seven lying in bed wondering why I didn't have a penis. Throughout my life, I've been bullied for my more masculine appearance. I was called names like boy, f it, dog and he, she, among others. I've also been essayed multiple times by both strangers and family members. When I was 17, I was diagnosed with debilitating endometriosis, which caused me to have painful periods and sent me on a monthly hormonal roller coaster. As I look back, I see how all this shaped my sense that becoming a woman would mean subjecting myself to a lifetime of assault and abuse. 
abuse and experiencing relentless mental and physical pain. I dropped out of high school in 1997 and had a series of minimum wage jobs where I was often harassed. A turning point happened when I was 24 years old. I enrolled in a community college and discovered a love of the arts, a passion I still pursue in my free time. Around that time, I watched a reality series called Transgeneration, which followed four transgender college students. The show was life-changing for me. I felt it presented a solution, a way out of the pain of being a woman. The year 2011 was agonizing for me. I lost the one family member who had been a consistent support, my maternal step-grandmother. She and I talked on the phone every day for years. Her death crushed me. I also wanted my painful periods to go away and to no longer feel that my emotions were out of my control. I didn't have health insurance, so I turned to the internet to find a solution. I watched hundreds of hours of YouTube videos and read countless blogs and websites that detailed people's transitions. These stories are what helped convince me I wanted to transition too. At this time, I was in graduate school studying studio art and I started seeing a school therapist. She was extremely supportive of my decision to transition and wrote me a letter of referral for testosterone. I also legally changed my name to Tiger, a pet name from a former girlfriend. Before I transitioned, I was someone who cried often when I was sad, angry, or joyful. I couldn't hold back my tears. But one of the earliest effects of testosterone was losing the ability to cry. The testosterone replaced my tears with rage that could come out of nowhere. I'm embarrassed now to think how my spurts of anger have hurt those around me. But there were parts of transitioning I welcomed. For example, having a beard. The whole process of growing one was exciting. It symbolized that I was really making a change and doing something new for myself. In 2015, when I was 35 years old, I met Jamie, then a single mom of two rambunctious kids at church. She just divorced her husband and I had just gone through a bad breakup. At this point, Jamie and I were both believers that the transgender movement, which was growing in visibility and power, was a good thing, an answer to people's distress. Within the year, we were engaged to be married. Sounds like typical lesbian behavior to me. But anyway, to the outside world, Jamie and I looked like a heterosexual couple. But when out by myself, people usually assumed I was a gay man. I struggled to relate to other men, and I also lost my connection to the lesbian community, which I still miss dearly. I also felt freakish. My chest was covered with hair, but I I also bound my breast each day so that no one would see features that made me look female. So in 2016, when I was 36, I had a double mastectomy. But in the days following the surgery, I grieved over the loss of my breast. Today, the harmful physical effects of over a decade on testosterone have started to make themselves known. High cholesterol, high blood pressure, type 2 diabetes, high triglycerides, sleep apnea, and issues with my kidneys. While some of these problems are hereditary, the testosterone in my system only exacerbates them. All those around me, from my close friends to my colleagues, supported my transition and referred to me with male pronouns. But I always felt a nagging sense that no matter what I did to myself to appear more male, I was an imposter. It turns out transitioning couldn't bring me the sense of comfort and inner peace I was seeking. In 2020, when I first put our adopted son, then six months old, in my arms, I instinctively knew how to rock him to sleep, to calm him by the way I held him. I became the parent who put him to bed most of the time. I know that fathers can comfort their infants, but when I did it, I felt like his mother. Jamie has never pressured me about detransitioning. I've been thinking about it for several years now, but I only told Jamie about my decision in the past three months. For detransitioners, there is no clear path. Gender affirming clinicians have been ignoring and dismissing our concerns. While my transition was covered by insurance, my detransition is not. To restore my hairline and remove my body hair will cost me thousands. In the next few years, I may have breast reconstructive surgery. There are many questions I don't have the answers to, such as whether my kids, now ranging in age from 2 to 16, years old should still call me dad. I am planning to change my name back to Roxanne and to change my license so it says female again, but I wonder if I'll ever pass as a woman. The gender affirming care model relies on vulnerable people's impatience, rushing them toward major medical changes rather than stopping to understand the root of their pain and suffering. This affects not just patients, but entire families. And as Jamie has shown, confused and scared parents get told falsely that without transition, their children will likely commit self-delete. I'm going public because I want people like me who have complex and nuanced reasons for their gender distress to be part of the conversation. I want people to know there are more options than medicalizing their bodies for the rest of their lives. Okay, so I wanted to read you that story in that person's own words because I think that people like this do often get left out of the conversation while I think they're the most valuable when it comes to 
discussing this because when we're talking about transitioning minors, which most of us, the majority of us, even in the community, are definitely against, a lot of times the activist will try to say that these kids know at these young ages exactly what they are. And here we have a 44-year-old man that was really making his transition in his 30s. So you would assume, well... I guess I should be saying she and her now, which is kind of confusing for me too. But I think the pronouns are unimportant in this kind of situation. So if you're stuck on that and you're going to be in the comments like, you should be saying she, you should shut up because I'm just trying to make an actual point here. And as long as we both know who I'm talking about, then shut up. I don't care about your language policing on either side right now because it happens all the time with the trans people and then it happens with the people that are quote unquote anti-trans. Both sides, shut up. Pronouns don't matter. That's why I always say I don't care about pronouns. And sorry to get upset. I know some of you guys don't like it when I get upset, but God damn am I tired of people acting so stupid about this stuff because everybody pretends to care about these people. Whether it's trans minors or trans adults, everybody pretends to care about them. But then it's always the least important things that people are stuck on like do the pronouns really matter in this situation or is it more important that we just both know who I'm talking about what I'm talking about so when it comes to this particular person what I'm trying to get at is I think that these people can be very valuable in also letting the younger generation know hey this may not be the solution for you and I as a full-grown adult really did think it was the solution for me I'm speaking as this person right now in case you can't tell and then ended up realizing that the reality of it wasn't what I thought it was going to be. It wasn't the magic pill that I needed. The surgeries weren't the magic pill that I needed. And technically, it made my life worse. If you think about it from that perspective, rather than being an I told you so and acting like this person should have known better and just being able to kind of laugh in their face, which is something I notice a lot of people doing when people choose to detransition, which there's only one detransitioner I don't like, and I'll end up making a video about that person coming up just because I think they really really were meant to be what they were transitioning to and then they got cold feet and now they hate on every person that's transitioning which isn't the way to go either and I don't think that this person or Jamie Reed are trying to hate on people that are transitioning or that truly do have gender dysphoria I think that Jamie Reed and Tiger Reed are both trying to say why don't we pause and really make sure that we've exhausted all avenues as far as working on the mental goes before we immediately move to medical medicalization before we immediately move to taking steps that'll make it so these people will have lifetime maintenance in what it is that they're trying to achieve or in what it is they think that they want to achieve. And that's why I wanted to put a spotlight on this because a lot of these stories get lost and we're told by the community that there's a very small, small group of detransitioners. When if you just look online, you'll see that there are thousands of detransitioners, but we're just not allowed to hear from them. Them. We're not allowed to talk about the fact that, like this person says, when you come out, you get a bunch of support. And that's not only in real life, but online. And then when you realize, if you realize that this has been a mistake and now you have to detransition, suddenly everybody hates you. And what's that doing to people's mental health? Having that same support system taken away from them, do you think that doesn't hurt them? Because I would argue that it probably does. Maybe all sides should exercise the compassion that they all claim to be moving in and think about stories like this when they're trying to persuade not only minors but also adults into taking steps that may only make their lives worse and may only make them more unhappy. Thankfully, this person has their wife, Jamie Reed, and their children, so probably a good family support system. And I know some people are be like, these people shouldn't be raising kids. You know, if I had a dollar for every kid that I knew growing up that had had completely messed up heterosexual parents. I wouldn't be worried about how much money this video is going to make. <laughs> All right, I'm being silly. I'm being silly, but I wouldn't be working. I really wouldn't because everybody I knew growing up had messed up parents, including myself. I mean, my parents were great in a lot of ways, but they definitely were dealing with their own things. So when people go hard on that, it's like, no, that's not necessarily the answer. Just that these people shouldn't have kids. Maybe these people are some of the best parents because if their kid runs into any situations like this, they can tell them, hey, these are the things we're going to think about. And no, we're not going to move right into some sort of treatment.
treatment or an actual program. Counseling is what you need. Just counseling, just someone to talk to. But as far as you making changes to yourself physically, that's not an option. And all you have to do is look to your mother. All right, I know, I take some cheap shots every once in a while. It's not meant to be like that. It's just, this has to be fun in some way or else why are you gonna watch? But you know, just look at your daddy mommy to know how that might not be the best course of action. Anyway, let me know what you guys think down below in the comments. I'm sure some people are gonna disagree with me and I'm sure some people are gonna call me stupid, but have your fun down there. I'll read what I read. I'll respond to what I respond to. As always, this has been Ty Rivera, the absolute best LGBTQ comedian in the world. They bought into his bullshit.